Hi everyone and welcome to Tap Into Your Creativity. Today we have artist Lawrence Devalmi and she is going to join Philadelphia. Um, she's originally from France and I can't wait for all of you to, there you are, welcome Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, um, I was just in the process of um, introducing you, um, but I mean, there's no one better than yourself to introduce yourself, but I just wanted to say first and foremost, uh, thank you for giving me the chance um, to um, interview you and for us to get to know you and get to know your incredible artwork and throughout this process i think i found a new friend in you <laughs> and uh you are a beautiful person a beautiful soul inside and out and i am truly truly honored uh that you came on board and you trusted me to uh become one of the army of artists Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to uh, to be here and um, and to have to connect with your community at large. So that's great. Yes. Well, um, tell us a little bit about um, yourself, who you are, where were you born, and um, where are you now? But take us back to um, first, where were you born, and a little bit of your childhood years. So I was born in Africa. I was born in, uh, it was called Zaire at the time. I was born in Kinshasa. It's now the Republic Democratic of Congo. And I didn't spend many years there because my parents moved back to France after their uh, adventures in Africa. But um, it certainly left uh, a trace. Uh, so my parents are French and uh, we moved back there, then we lived a bit in England. And um, it certainly gave me the envy to go abroad again and to, uh, yeah, to be attracted by um, foreign country. And my husband was also born uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, so I guess I was attracted by his exotic background, <laughs> so that certainly uh, left a trace. So, and now I live in uh, near Philadelphia, uh, and been here for uh, almost eight years in America. So, were you living in? I guess why were your parents in Africa? Just they took a year <laughs> off, or no? My dad had uh, his job taking him there, and I guess he also was attracted by the. Uh, adventure of it so he he worked there I mean we spent the family spent seven years there but I was uh, among the last uh, kids uh, so I didn't get to spend a lot of time but I went back so I visited yes and yes and I guess um being in 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 Europe and living in Europe and being in Paris specifically yes. um you were probably just you had so much art and, you know, and surrounded yourself by incredible architecture, museums, cathedrals. I'm sure you were a very much a part of that and that influenced you a lot. Of course, and especially my mom is uh, an artist and she's uh, very curious. So every time we arrived somewhere, the first thing we would do is, you know, go to visit the museums or she would manage to find the one art exhibition around. Uh, so, you know, it gives you the taste of that. Uh, but I mean, we are four kids and we're not all uh, artists, so I guess it's all a mix. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, right. And so I, I yes, I just uh, started to be interested by art and, uh, kept on doing it and I learned uh, mostly by myself because I was um, uh, as a high when I finished high school I was attracted by art studies but then I was a bit also afraid of you know everybody telling you it's going to be hard to make a career and so on and so I got admitted to uh, like one of the best university uh, for to, to study economics so I was like okay I'll do that but it was, you know, I it was not your passion for sure. No, 
But I mean, I'm happy I did it. I guess I was maybe not mature enough to also embrace uh, being an independent worker at the time. So I spent almost uh, a bit more than 15 years working in the corporate world uh, and marketing. And that was a great um, also school. Um, and I'm a social person, so I liked to interact with uh, other people. So, And so going back, so you finished your degree, and then um, how did you actually make the jump from economics to now being you know, a complete, fully professional artist. How, how does that even happen? I, I never stopped painting. And uh, in 2003, my husband, uh, my now husband, uh, went to study in the USA. So I took a year off and I went with him um, and I did art only. And that was great. Uh, so we, it, it really was key in my path to uh, develop what I wanted to do. And then I went back to France. Uh, we had two kids, full-time job. So of course the arts were a bit <laughs> in the background and I wasn't so active. I did a few shows, exhibitions and so on. So we moved back to the US in 2013. And that's when, you know, the kids were grown up. I mean older, uh, I had more space, so I started to be fully involved into my art and um, after a few years I was working part-time as a consultant in marketing, but I decided to uh, give it a try and to be 100% dedicated to my art, so that's what I decided to do in 2015. And because I realized, you know, you're already 40 plus uh, or 40 at the time, you need to go <laughs> full gear to have a chance to do something about it. And I didn't, I didn't want to be only exhibiting in, in just a few local shows. I wanted to really see if I could um, reach out to galleries and if my work could be you know, exhibited uh, in, on a wider scale. So I realized I really needed to uh, dedicate myself to it. So and obviously you also have a love of history of art and um, you know because now your work and I want to ask you when was the jump to now what you're doing now but um, because your love of history of art history it plays a very big part on, on your art today and how the relationship of an artist um, mm -hmm. with social media today, how is that interconnected? And we'll get into that. But before we go to that, um, were you always a realist uh, painter? Did you um, learn that um, on your own? How, how did that even, even so, happen? Uh I, I think I tried, you know, everything, every medium. I, I started to work in watercolor, then oils when I was 11, 10. I took some one year class of oils. And then, um, so I kept working with that. And I tried a bit everything. And in 2003, I was working mainly in abstract. And I moved to the US. And in fact, I visited uh, some art exhibitions and I became interested by contemporary realism. And uh, in particular, I discovered the painter Janet Fish, um, who's an American realist uh, who really got her breakthrough in the 60s, 70s. And I really got fascinated by how she could recreate the reflections. So. I challenged myself to learn that. So I just, you know, got some books uh, and worked, practiced, and, and that was it. I learned how to do uh, realism. I realized I was, uh, I had some aptitude to do it. You had a gift. I, 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 I <laughs> you <help>. have a gift. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I also got, you know, I discovered photorealism and, and all that uh, movement. Um, so that was my still how I worked in for a good 10 years. 
Um, and when I uh, decided to start my professional career, that was what I was doing. Then I realized that um, it was difficult to, uh, to have a place on, on, in the art world, just doing, just doing nice, pretty things. I, I, want, I was not satisfied, totally satisfied with my body of work because I felt it lacked uh, a message and a consistency. I was, you know, going here and there and I realized that I, I wanted something that was really unique to me. And um, I got interested into how Instagram was used by artists. So it took me a good six, eight months to, to find my signature, I would say, or something that was really a body of work that would be uniquely mine. And I don't know, so one day I got this idea of doing an Instagram uh, because people would always tell me that my paintings looked like photos. And I was like, oh, maybe I could play around with that, you know, and Instagram. And then I was like, I need to tell a story. And boom. <laughs> because I love to read. So that's It what... was really, truly the perfect storm for you. Because not yeah. only did you find your voice through it, um, but now you have a full body of work, very recognizable, um, there is a big story behind each painting and, um, and you really truly come out, you came out of your shell in a way that maybe you even surprised yourself. Yeah. And so that was funny because at first I was like, you know, is it even interesting? Is it even worth something? So um, I did the three first paintings and I showed them to uh, two very good friends of mine. Uh, and uh, they were very enthusiastic and very supportive. So um, Alan Gorman, who's a very good friend, uh, saw my work and told me, oh, you should apply to uh, an artist residency, which is called the SKF. It's based in New Jersey. And he was a resident there at the time. So he kind of gave me the idea. I would never have thought that, you know, I was eligible to that. So. I applied and Eileen I, Kaminsky, who is the founder, uh, thought it was a, a good project. So she gave me a residency on the spot and three months later I was there. And so it also gave me the, um, you know, I had three paintings and then I was like, okay, now I need to, <laughs> <laughs> I need to, uh, to deliver on that. So it was How great. long was the residency for? It was three months. Okay. Uh, so it's based in Jersey City, and it's an amazing experience. But were you commuting back and forth, or you actually live there? No, they don't have um, uh, housing. They just uh, offer you a studio space, and um, and uh, you can work for. And you have to be there a minimum of hours per week. Um, yeah, it's also, actually. I think it's. I, I, I'm a huge fan of residencies. I've done them like five times in my life, and I will continue to do them because it is something that um, there's something to say about working with other artists mm -hmm. and feeding from each other, and that energy that comes from it is nothing that you can actually verbalize because it's something so internal, and you grow so much, and your painting grows so much. Um, that I think it is very important to go back and have those in, in person. Not yeah. only, you know, now that we're, you know, everything is uh, via Zoom or, you know, doing everything electronically. I hope that at some point we come, we can come back and, and do those in person. I know, yeah, I know they have reopened, I guess, with some uh, measures, but uh, uh, yeah, it's... Uh obviously more challenging these days, but it will come back. Yes, yes. Well, I'm going to be showing some of your work. All right. Um, so we can talk about it. And um, so why don't we start right there? So yes, Hilma F. Clint, I got uh, interested in her um, uh, because I, I mean, I, I bumped in, so since I'm interested into women artists, I got uh, exposed to her artwork and her story uh, appealed to me and I was very happy she got her retrospective that made her, you know, more um, 
famous uh, to the general public. So she was a Swedish artist and she uh, was interested into uh, spiritualism. And so she did some um, with four of her friends that were doing discussions with spirits. And so the paintings are supposed to be uh, dictated by uh, the high masters, how she would call them. And so, of course, you know, it, we believe what we want to believe. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I, it, it kind of uh, appealed to me to think that there is something behind, uh, something above. Or, and um, so that's the story of hers. And she kept the, the paintings she did hidden. And in her will, uh, they were supposed to be kept hidden for 20 years after her death. So that's why she became famous uh, really very light compared to when she lived uh, and uh, she was now we know the first abstract artist when all the art history book tell you it's Kandinsky but it seems it abstract was in the air at the time. It's so interesting I, I love the backstory of all of them. So Ahmad Thomas is um, also a very inspiring person because she's a uh, uh, she, she was an arts teacher for her whole career and then when she retired she started to uh, start her career as a professional artist. So you know you sometimes think yo it's too late and she was 67 and she got uh, a solo show at the Whitney Museum when she was 72 and I love that you know the fact that she was... Um... Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Like... Yeah. There's never an age. You just never know when it's going to hit or when it's not. And that's why you have to keep trying and showing up and, and working hard because you just don't know when it's, when it's your turn. Yeah, so all the comments that I put in my paintings are based on uh, the research I do on their lives. And I Unfortunately, I can't um, no, but make them bigger. <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you know them by heart, please go ahead and, and no, share that with you. I don't, but I, I remember who is commenting, but I just dig into, um, so it's awesome that now a lot of things are available online and I could uh, access to some uh, of her journals that are published on the uh, national archives or I don't know, so I could dig into that and could find some um, articles that were written about her exhibitions uh, when she was, she had her first uh, exhibition in that university where she had been a teacher. So it's all to, to say that my comments are not invented. They are based on actual facts. Of course, I rephrase what was said at the time. And that's what makes it so um, modern and fresh and, and what we live in right now, because um, you know, it's, it's what the, their contemporaries would be saying right now to them. I, I, we can imagine. So love is, uh, I, when I looked into that uh, painting a bit more, I learned that it had been created to be a Christmas card and uh, for the MoMA. So it was a commission from the MoMA to uh, Robert in Vienna. And uh, of course, it was the most successful uh, Christmas card ever. And... Um, it has the story we know, and I refer in the story that uh, so Bill Cass was an assistant of uh, Indiana, and he advised him to uh, copyright uh, his work, which he did not do. And at the time, there was no law that would protect uh, the creation of artists. So it changed now, but at the time, so he got ripped off a lot from his work. Oh, no, that's not okay. I did not know that. That is terrible. But I did see the comment. So, yeah. um, and I love Andy Warhol's comment here too. Yeah, they were big friends. And um, so I... They I'm, had each other's backs. Yes. Oh, <laughs> again, Hilma. <laughs> also is another of her paintings and uh, around the same, uh, the same body of work that she did and that was exhibited at the Guggenheim. So, um, so we have, um, okay, let me just go back here and, uh, huh, I don't know how to go back to, oh, I know, sorry, <laughs> I 
I'm like, how do I go back to myself? <laughs> so um, I guess we're going to talk about the artwork that is in your studio right now, um, which is in transition for people that you know, may think that that's why you don't have um, everything on the walls is because you are not yeah. working on the walls right now. <laughs> so yeah, this is a painting by Lee Krasner. And uh, it was um, so created uh, just after the death of uh, Jackson Pollock. Um, and uh, it's uh, a moment of her life when she was grieving uh, for her husband, but they had been separated for also some bit of time. So it was mixed feelings and it was also a time of liberation for her as an artist because she had been working so much for her husband's career i mean there would probably not be he would not have been as famous as he became without her because she was really like his agent and um and so for her as an artist she started to work again and to use his studio and so she created this body of work which is called the uh, earth series and she was saying that she had been asked, you know, about her uh, view on, on life and painting. And she declared that painting is life and she wanted to continue to live. So she kept on painting. And uh, it was a very, you know, uh, I thought very bright colors and very positive painting at her time, at, at a time when it was hard for her. So it's... Uh, well, I think you said the right word. I mean, I think in a way it was liberating to come out of the shadows and be able to be her own self yeah. and um, and to be able to show the world that she was a an, an artist um, on on her two feet by herself. And, and so this painting was created. Uh, so when I started to uh, to work on that, I was like, I want to do a series around these uh, women. I had read the book Nine Streets Women um, by Mary Gabriel, and I contacted uh, Art Girl Rising, which is a platform that supports uh, awareness for women artists. And I was like, oh, maybe we could do collaboration. So um, Liesl, the founder of Art Girl Rising, uh, Thought it was a good idea, so we created the collaboration with Can Gallery, who represent my work uh, in London. So we did this T-shirt that I wear with yeah names of amazing women artists, abstract women artists, and uh, a painting for each of them. So it's part of that. Yes, and um, it, it, it's fascinating because you are really. Um, finding these women who are um, masters of abstraction that were in the shadow of men. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, now we know that um, they were as strong and as dedicated as each one of them. Mm -hmm. And their voices were so um, not heard at the time. And now they're so loud that I'm so proud to, you know, to look and dig into them because they are, um, each one of them, they are like my, I feel like they're my teachers and I look up to them and I, you know, and, and I, I, they will be so proud now to know where they are and where their work has, what has their work has become. Yeah. So that's, um, yeah, the story of that. Painting thing. Okay, so <laughs> let's let's go around and look at the rest. I'll uh, maybe take the phone because it will be easier to show you around. So okay, there is. Oops, let me try there. Do you see? Oh, so yes. there's a new one that I'm creating right now by Barbara Kruger. Oh uh, yeah. So it's uh, for an exhibition for Women's International Day. Um, and here, when is that going to be, uh, it's going to be in March. Uh, okay. The dates are too, and I don't have the precise dates in mind. And how she, big are your paintings? How big are the canvas? So these are 40 by 30. Okay. But I did some smaller ones too. It depends on how, you know. And so you need to go in a little closer so we can see all the details. Okay. But on your Vincent. I want to make um, sure you see well, but it does. I'm not sure it's... Yeah, no, we can see. Okay, so that's the story of um, the Starry Night. 
that Van Gogh created while he was uh, in uh, Saint Remy de Provence in an asylum. And so I recreated, you know, like he would take a photo of his brushes in front of his. So everything is painted. It's yes. not a photograph, it's acrylic paint. And it is unbelievable because <laughs> it looks three dimensional to me. I want to grab those brushes. <laughs> and uh, so the detail on your painting, how long does it take you to create a painting? That's uh, a question I get often. I, it depends on the size and on the style also uh, of the artist that I recreate because of course, uh, depending on the level of details, like I'm working on the Murakami here. You can switch the camera, uh, Lawrence. Yes. There's a place where you can switch the camera and you'll be able to see what we're seeing. That way, there we go. Yes. That way it will be That's easier that. for you to show Thank us. Thank you. So this is a Murakami that I'm working on. Oh, and wow. I understand why he has an army of assistants because the level of details is just <laughs> crazy. Can you go in a little bit so we can yeah. see? That's wow. No, work in progress. So. Yeah. And it's all acrylic on canvas, correct? Yeah, correct. So I prepare my canvas, I just, you know, tape and then I work from there. And, um, and I know you use the original, um, you have like uh, photographs of them and then you have them on the side so you know exactly to be able to recreate that and then Yes. Depending on the angle, like the one from Van Gogh that I would like to go back now that you know what we're seeing. Yes. Um, because it's, it's, let me go back. It has so much detail and it looks so real and it looks like it would be something that he would take a picture of, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that's, uh, that was my, because I got inspired by a letter that he wrote to his brother and uh, he was thanking his brother for brushes that his brother had sent to him. And uh, he was referring to uh, the night, uh, the starry night that he called a study. And he was not really happy about it. So uh, he was afraid the stars were too big. So that's what I put in my comments. And his brother was like, yeah, it's, it's interesting, but... It's not as good as when you uh, you paint true things like your irises. So I just use. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the irony of it. Is now it's probably his most famous painting, but at the time he was not happy with it. And you also paint the um, icon on the top, correct? Uh, no. So the text and the icon, I print them. And I apply them on the canvas and then... Oh, I, okay. I, I didn't... I thought that you also painted the icon. I, I knew that the text was... Um, but I, I wasn't sure about the icon. Yeah. Well, that, that makes your life a little easier, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I started to uh, hand paint it, but then it was not... Um, uh, I wanted the letters to be really precise so that's why yeah no it, it had to be this way it, yeah. that's why it's so um so successful you know and here is my latest uh, duo so oh. let me turn around the, this about pop and it's uh interesting because Liechtenstein created this in 1966 for newsweek magazine and uh, 20 years later, almost day per day, Keith Haring created this one for his pop shop. And they were good friends, so I, I don't have any proof of it, but I believe it was a tribute from Keith Haring to, uh, to Liechtenstein, because you can see it really has a look and feel. They, they kind of match. Well, it has the same palette. It has the yeah. same um, word in it. It I has, uh, you know, and it's so brilliant because you know one is Liechtenstein and the other one is Keith Haring. I know. <laughs> they're, they're, you cannot, you know, this is like a perfect, um, a perfect marriage of each other, yeah. I guess. And, uh, and yeah. Here is uh, another painting I did recently for David Hockney. Yes, let me turn 
around this good way and it's uh, based on a portrait of an artist that became his most uh, expensive painting um, that was sold a few years ago and it was done when he was um, separating from his uh, young uh, lover De um, Peter Schlesinger and um, so it was a time also of a difficult time for him, but he managed to overcome it through his art. And uh, he finished the painting like a day before he sent it to New York, just in time for an art exhibition. Uh, so I refer to that. Can you show us the comments on that one? Yes. So he declared that, you know, it was six months of struggle because he had been working on the first painting that he destroyed. And then he did the second one in two weeks uh, between England and France, because the view is from France. He went to um, south of France to take the photos of the pool. And um, John Sinclair, which is the last comment, is the photograph who uh, was the model in the pool. So, <laughs> oh my God, that is hilarious. Yeah, so he did like, a ton of uh, back and forth in that pool. And Jack Hazen was a movie director who um, lent um, Hockney some lights so Hockney could work, you know, even during the nighttime. And so to, uh, uh, the, the exchange was that in exchange, Hazen could uh, film Hockney while he was painting. That's incredible. <laughs> How, which one has been the most difficult or most challenging, you think? Uh, uh, in, in terms of painting? Yes. Well, this Murakami would probably be among them. <laughs> yes. I uh, know you did uh, Gustav Klimt. And yeah, I was I'm going sure to say uh, the lady, in, uh, woman in gold. Woman in gold. The portrait of Adele is also, was uh, among my most uh, challenging ones. Yeah, I'm sure. Did you actually use a uh, uh, gold leaf on that one or not? No, I used acrylic too. Uh, acrylic you did? Paint. Yeah. Because so. it looks very, you know, the texture of the gold, actually, you were able to create a very good, um, what what uh, materials do you use? Golden or? Uh, different brands. Uh, different for brands. gold, I, I mix uh, pure pigment. Uh, in powder to uh, gold painting because that's I, why yeah that's why layer. it's so rich it's beautiful and also I put like six or seven layers okay so it really becomes uh, there you cannot see the traces of the, the brush anymore yeah I want it to be really like it's pure gold yes that's why it takes a long time because all the layers so now we come to the very exciting part yeah. <laughs> um, because um, Lawrence was um, so generous and she is giving for Feeding America um, uh, prints that are $250 each and um, they will be for sale right now. And so if you are interested in purchasing, um, you should DM me or Lawrence. Um, because this is incredible. Her work is unbelievable. You will be helping so many people in need. So if you're interested in purchasing um, this artworks, do you have them handy? Because if yeah. not, I have them too. Um, just uh, to say they are not prints. They are, uh, I mean, of course, the text is printed. But the oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's just uh, acrylic on paper. Acrylic on paper. Oh, yeah, so I created this one for today um, and it's based on a Keith Haring uh, painting and his uh, love of uh, the red color. So if you have a Valentine present to make, that could be a good, uh, a good match. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so it is acrylic on paper and um, it's an original um, from Lawrence. And it's two hundred and fifty dollars, and um, and I am so excited because it is amazing, and I actually love, 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 love your work. And so this um, is the second one, yes. So Bridget uh, Riley, the English artist, 
Uh, so Lawrence is so incredibly generous that she decided to give a second one as well for 250. So in total, we would be making $500 for Feeding America. So um, if you're interested in either one of those, please let me or Lawrence know. Um, you would be helping so many people in need. Um, and this is why I'm doing this Tap Into Your Creativity, um, because we are working as a community of artists and not as one, but as we. And by doing that, we're helping so, so many people. So, um, Lawrence, what, what is your... Um, do you have a favorite artist now that you've really digged in into their past? Is there anyone that grabs you more? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, there is always uh, Edouard Manet, which uh, was uh, one of my first uh, revelation when I was a kid and I visited the Musée d'Orsay and I saw the Olympia and then I read books about him and um, he was a rather feminist uh, artist in his own way because he had three students and they were all women. He always uh, described uh, the difficulties of being a woman, like used by men, in, in, especially at the, in the 19th century. Uh, so I like him as an artist and as a person. Um, uh, we know now that he married uh, his wife who already had a kid. Uh, and it is likely that the kid was not his, but he was uh, the son of his own father. So he gave her, you know, uh, because if you were a woman with a kid without being married, uh, so he kind of repaired the mistake of his dad by marrying this uh, woman. So I think he was really a very decent person, it seems. Um, so that's him. And uh, David Hockney is certainly one of my go-to artist i love him as a artist and also as a person he's so uh you know if i if i feel down i just have to listen to an interview with david hockney and then you you have a smile <laughs> on your face so i turn back on the comments for people to ask you questions but i do have a question about if if you had any um things to say to new artists or emerging artists or even established artists um, what would you say? What what has worked for you? Practice, <laughs> certainly, and uh, to build uh, my career, it was through community. I mean, I when I moved here, I knew no one, and especially no one in the art world. So I started to connect with people on Facebook, Instagram, and I wasn't on social media before I moved to the US. So it's to say it was a big leap for me. And that's how I started to learn and to meet people. Uh, and, you know, one person introduced you to the other and so on. So, yeah. And, and um, one thing that we haven't talked about that was very, very cool is that um, the gallery that you represented in New York um, they, um, they grab one of your paintings for, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, for, uh, the HBO series, uh, The Undoing, which got four Golden Globes nomination. I'm like, woo, I feel I'm nominated to the Golden Globe myself. Yes, you <laughs> did. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. So, I mean, it's incredible that they, um, they wanted one, I mean, I'm not surprised, but how cool to see one of your paintings on TV on that incredible series with Nicole Kidman and, uh, and seeing your painting in the background. Like, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it was very, very cool. So, um, so how do you um, approach galleries? Um, do you like working with galleries? Would you rather be working on your own and selling on your own? What, is, what has worked for you? I, I love working with galleries because they are, it's not like I work with galleries. I work with some persons, you know, they are very yeah. small galleries and we have a personal relationships. So I feel like it's more a team. Uh, and um, so I was lucky in a way that all the galleries I work with, they approached me or I was introduced. Uh, we met through common friends 
so you know it, it, it builds upon time uh, so sometimes I've been I'm asked you know how to approach galleries and I'm a bit sure to answer because I never really did it uh, it's, it was more like through meetings with someone oh I'm gonna you know introduce you to that person so that's why communities is key because it's how it uh, enabled me to build my uh, my path you know little by little Yes, and I, I think that's the key, what you just said, little by little. Um, you can get so eager that you want to eat the world in one day because that's oh, yeah. just not going to happen. I mean, I just have to be patient. When I started, it was like, it's like I'm an intern. Uh, you cannot be the CEO right away. So I, my first show was in a restaurant in New York, and I was very grateful for the opportunity to show my work. And it was great to um, to learn how to to make a show, to communicate about it, and so on. And yeah, that's you know you have to uh, to learn step by step. Yes, and I think that you know you work in in your studio in your home, so you're by yourself um, mm -hmm. most of the time. And um, that's another great thing that by building community and and outreach and and getting to know artists uh, like minded. Um, you start speaking the same language. And yeah. so um, it's important to find that wherever you are because sometimes you don't have that around you and you just need to reach out so you can bounce ideas from each other. You can have critiques, um, uh, positive critiques from each other and really learn um, together versus being by yourself. I think that's very important. Yeah. So I'm part also of a community called ArtCan, and it's an international uh, artist community, uh, originally based in London. Uh, it's a non-profit, and the goal is to uh, exactly do what you just described. And uh, I love it. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think it's important to um, lift each other up as artists. Yes and uh, help each other when we can instead yes. of uh, you know bringing each other down I think it mm -hmm. used to be way in the in the past years where you know um, I wanted to be better than the next one who's you know right here and I think we are all shoulder to shoulder and um, the more we understand that the better we will be as artists um, especially history shows that the artists who succeeded were the ones who were part of a group yes uh, take the impressionist if you take the abstract expressionist yes of artists they work together you know they exchanged uh, show group shows and they of course there were some rivalry inside the groups because they have egos and uh, that, 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 that big ones <laughs> in, we know that but it doesn't and the young British artist uh, led by uh, Damien Hirst they became so successful because they, they joined. They created this big show and then suddenly they were on the art scene and uh, they became... Uh, so, yeah, I do really believe in that. I agree. I think that, you know, the more, you know, we lift each other and the more we work together, I think that people are really now um, thanking us that we're opening our studio doors and sharing our inspirations. And I'm an open book, so people know that they can just ask me whatever they want. And if I have the knowledge, I will share it with you because I want you to be better. I, I want to be better every day. So I never stop learning. I always learn something new. And I've learned so many incredible things by each one of these incredible interviews that I've made because everyone is so generous with their um, process. And um, so it's been really fascinating. Yeah, so, that notes, that's why also I created uh, my blog, uh, The Curious Frenchie, and thank you for being part of it. Yes, uh, I love it. Because I... Can I, you tell us a little bit about that for people I, that I, don't know the, you? Know I, that? You know, I met people who were either, at, at the start, it was also some uh, startup founders and... Uh, people I met in New York that were so incredible, who had so many different experiences, are like, wow, I need to share these, uh, you know, inspiring paths and, um, and stories. So I started to create my blog a little bit, you know, without thinking much about it. And, and I, it became a hobby and now also something I like to do. And I write for 
my blog. I write for um, French Quarter magazine, which is a French American magazine, and uh, Femme d'Art, um, which is a French platform that we met. Yes, have. I went in there and I wanted to listen to something, but I couldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's only in French. <laughs> I know, but I loved it though. It's 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 just really really great. So, um, tell us where we can find you. Where if people want to buy your work, where is a good place to find you? And um... Instagram is always a good place to start. Uh, of okay. course, I have a website, and all the links are on my Instagram uh, Laurence Deval page. Uh, so that is probably uh, the good to place. Uh, and then, of course, I, I have works on Artsy by the different galleries I work with. So, yeah, it's great. Easy to so find. One more time, we're going to go um, see the pieces that we will be donating today. Um, so, if you um, think that you want to purchase an um, artwork from Lawrence for $250, um, she will be selling this one and this one, but you can't really see this one for some yeah, reason. I can um, show them. But them. it's um, acrylic on paper, and it's an 11 by 14, I believe. Yes. And um, so for $250 each, if you're interested, please let me or Lawrence know, and uh, we'll take care of the rest. And 100% of the proceeds will go to Feeding America. So... Lawrence, I can't thank you enough. Um, you are wonderful. Your work is amazing. I wish you nothing but success. Thank and um, we'll all the best too. And I know we'll be in touch very often. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Take care and have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.